Oh, this morning we're going to do a very, very short book. It's actually the shortest book uh, that was written by the Apostle Paul. It's called Philemon. And uh, if you find any book beginning with the letter T in the New Testament, it comes straight after them. So 1 and 2 Thessalonians, uh, 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy and Titus. Then Philemon is where you find it. So it's a very, very short book. And uh, if you're going to give it a title, I'd call it Paul Applies the Gospel to a Runaway Slave. And as soon as we look at uh, slavery, we would now see it as being absolutely horrifying. <coughs> but every culture, as far as people can tell, has had slavery. And it's only in the last couple of hundred years that people have actually fought against slavery. Oddly enough, there are more slaves in the world today than any time that has been known. There's meant to be about 23 million of them. Uh, a lot of women, a lot of girls. About a third of them are slick sex slaves. Uh, a lot of them are very, very badly treated. And so slavery is still out there. And you've got to say to yourself, well, what changed people's mindset? So how do people like William Wilberforce fight for slavery to be stopped? It was actually the gospel. It was the words of Jesus, the words of the New Testament, words of the Apostle Paul, so deeply impacted all of the evangelical Protestant Christians, they became uh, the strong fighters against slavery. And when slavery was first fought against, it was in a society where everybody loved slavery. And so when you said, don't do slavery, people said, but I like having a slave. They are so helpful for us. Uh, you know, why would you want to get rid of them? And so uh, let's look to this letter of Philemon, because uh, this has some... Uh, Paul doesn't stop slavery, but he does a lot of radical changes in their view. And we're going to do this uh, book over two weeks. And so this week I'd call it more of an introduction to look at some of the big picture things that are behind the book. And then next week we'll look specifically how Paul responds to um, this slave. So who are our characters? Well, first of all, Philemon. And uh, Philemon appears to be a key church leader. He also appears to be the man who owned Onesimus, who we'll find out about in a moment. And uh, was a very gracious person, and uh, you'll soon find out possibly his wife and his son, and uh, how that fitted in as a family network. So he's the first person. The second person in our story is a man called Onismus. Now Onismus appears to be a slave who stole some stuff from Philemon and then shot through. And somehow, we don't know how, we get to the third person, Paul. Because he meets Paul, whether he got arrested and got thrown to prison with Paul, we don't know. But somehow the two of them got together and uh, through this Onismus becomes a Christian. And of course he would have shared with Paul this, oh, it's exciting being a Christian. My old boss was a Christian, Philemon. And so Paul writes a letter to Philemon on behalf of Onismus. And so the next two weeks we're going to look at a bit of the background behind this. So let's turn to the first uh, verse here, Philemon chapter 1. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. And Timothy regularly occurs with Paul there as a co-writer with him and a supporter of him. And it says, to, to, to whom the letter is written, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, which is why people see him as being probably working in the church. To Aphia, our sister, many people would say that's most likely to be uh, his wife. And Archippus, and many people would say that's most likely to be his son. That's why the three of them are put together. But Archippus is described as our fellow soldier. And then the next person or group to be mentioned is to the church that meets in your home. So when Paul wrote this letter, it wasn't just a personal private letter. It was a sense of saying, this is a corporate letter. Let the church hear what we're saying because Paul, I think, was very certain of the response that was going to happen as a result of this letter. So why is Paul a prisoner? He stood up for his Christian faith. And uh, at one stage he said, I'm a Roman soldier and therefore you can't beat me and can't flog me. And uh, he said, I think my case needs to be heard by Caesar. And as you go through the, the, uh, the last half or probably the last third of the book of Acts, you see Paul's journey to Rome. And part of Paul's thinking is Christians are being persecuted. I'm a Roman citizen. I have more uh, a safety net to protect myself, but others don't have that safety net. And he wanted to fight to say that the Christian faith should be an approved legal part of the Jewish faith. And why is that? Because in the Roman Empire, there were only 
two legal religions. You can have many other legals, that didn't matter. But as long as you belong to one of these two groups, either you did Caesar worship or you were Jewish. And you're kind of thinking, well, why did the Roman Emperor let Jewish worship happen? Because the Jewish people said, we'll pay you large sums of money if you let us not worship you as God. We will support you, we'll encourage you, we'll fight in your armies, uh, we'll pay all your taxes, but we can't worship you as God because only God is God. And therefore we have the two religions. Paul wants to link the Christian faith to the Jewish faith, for its, um, that's its heritage. So he's in prison. What does he do in prison? He shares the gospel with everyone who comes to talk to him. So he had no troubles doing that. But we also wrote Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, and this letter here, Philemon. These four letters all are called the prison epistles. And Philemon is a letter, we'll find out, is very closely linked to two other letters, Ephesians and Colossians. Most likely, these letters were all put into one bundle and are sent together. We find in Colossians chapter 4 these words about Archippus. Now remember, Archippus appears to be Philemon's son. So in Colossians 4 it says, After this letter has been read to you, as into the corporate church there, see to it that it's also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And they in turn read the letter from Laodicea. So what's this letter of Laodicea? We call it the letter of Ephesians. So he said, I've got the Ephesians letter, they've got the Colossians letter. Make sure you swap letters so you can both read what I've said to both of you. Then it goes on to say, Tell Achippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. So Achippus the son appears to be a godly, gracious, mature Christian disciple. And Paul goes on to say, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's our dilemma. A slave's run away. The slave owner's a Christian. Paul's got to write a letter. Now, if you were a slave owner and your slave ran away, uh, in the Roman Empire, your slave is the same as your dog or your cat, your rabbit, your cow, your chooks. You can do whatever you like with them. And so if you uh, sat there one day and you beat your horse because you said, my horse is lazy, people say, it's your horse, you can do whatever you like, it's your horse. If you kicked your head in the dog, people might say, well, that's not a very nice thing to do, but it's your dog, you can do whatever you like. If you beat your slave, if you whipped your slave, if you even killed your slave, nobody would bat an eyelid. Because they say, that's your property. You can do whatever you like with your property. It's like us today. If someone's got a car, if their car is filthy, you don't care because it's their car. If their car's polished, you don't care because it's their car. If they go and uh, crash it into trees and, uh, and, uh, and uh, reverse into other people, as long as it doesn't reverse into you, you don't care because it's their car. That is how they treated slaves. So we've, uh, the, let's look at uh, some of the things that undergirded Paul's thinking in his letter. So the big thing is for you and I is that who God is should determine who we are. What is God's character is the character that you and I should aspire to. So God's character, God's actions, God's motivations need to be our actions, our uh, character and our motivations. And the key thing we're going to look at this morning is what does it mean to forgive? And sometimes the hardest thing to ever do is to forgive somebody who's hurt you. Now the worst thing is if you hold a grudge, who does you holding a grudge hurt most? Yourself. And some people just can't grasp that. And so let's have a look at the first thing I've got as, my, as our key point. What is God's character? What aspect of God's character should inspire us? What aspect of God's character should the Apostle Paul present to Philemon? Now let's turn to Numbers chapter 14 verse 18. It says, The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. The very essence of God's nature is one of forgiveness. He goes on in verse 19 to say, In accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people, just as you pardoned them from the time they left Egypt unto now. And so when Moses is writing, he's writing at a time where uh, the, uh, there have been 40 years in the wilderness. 
and there's a sense that the, uh, the Jewish nation had time after time rejected God and time after time God would forgive them and be gracious. Move a bit further into the Bible through the prophets to Jeremiah 31. It says, No longer will a man teach his neighbour or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And what is considered the key thing? For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. So Moses, the law, very much an emphasis on forgiveness. Jeremiah, the prophets, emphasis still there of God forgiving us. Now when we turn to the New Testament, what happens to forgiveness there? Let's look at Jesus, Mark chapter 2. It says there immediately Jesus knew in his spirit what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, what are you thinking? Which is the easier to do? To say to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk? And why did he have to say this? Because a man had been let down through the roof in front of Jesus. And the four guys who let the guy down would have said, our friend's paralyzed, hoping that Jesus would cure the guy. But Jesus' first words are, your sins are forgiven. And the guy's at the top of the thing, but he's paralyzed. Why are you talking about forgiveness? Because Jesus says, you're thinking about urgent things. I'm thinking about important things. The most important thing is his forgiveness. Yes, he will be healed, but that comes second. And he goes on to say, but this is that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Yes, the man is forgiven. And imagine the crowd there would have murmured to each other, say, who is this man who says he can forgive sins? Only God can do that. The nature of God is to be forgiving. Jesus, by his nature, was also forgiving, and he's doing what his Father says. Therefore, may you know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So one of the core aspects of God's character is to forgive. What's our second point for today? God's action. The gospel should guide us. The very core values of what the gospel is needs to be the centre of our core values. So back there in the Old Testament, Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. So when the early church starts, you're thinking, what will be the very, very first sermon they'd preach. Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has just been poured down on them. He uh, says to people, you know, that these people are not foolish, they're not drunk. And then he goes on to proclaim this. And Peter says to the people in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptised, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? The forgiveness of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and all who are far off. And we think about it, for some people, they have guilt, they have sorrow, they have burden, they have shame. And the older they get, the more they can see the failures and the miseries of what they've done in their life. For some people, they hold on to the worst aspects of their very being. For some people, the, the shame and the guilt is, I'm happy that no one can see my thoughts because my thoughts are evil at times. The people who know how selfish they can be. But the promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, for all who call on the name of the Lord. And the Apostle John in his letter, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins... God is faithful and just and forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So the very nature of God is to be forgiving. The very core of the gospel is the forgiveness found in Christ. That leads us to our third key area. What is God's motivation? What should lead us to live lives as forgiven people? What does it mean to be forgiven? And the letter of Philemon was attached to the letter of Ephesians and Colossians. And in Colossians chapter 3 it says this, Therefore as God's chosen people, you are holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, 
gentleness and patience. Wouldn't it be great if this is how we treated each other? There's nothing nicer than someone who gives you compassion when you do not deserve it. There are times you and I can do some really stupid, stupid things. And someone says, yeah, I know what you've done. You're a bit of an idiot, but that's okay. I forgive you. Let's move on. Paul goes on in verse 13 to say, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. So God's nature, forgiveness, the nature of the gospel, forgiveness, the essence of the Christian walk, forgiveness. He goes on to say, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. And there's nothing nicer than having someone who is gracious, compassionate and forgiving. That leads us to our fourth key area that if, if God is by nature forgiving, if the gospel is forgiving, if we've got a grasp that we are being forgiven by God, the fourth thing is that we need to learn what it means to forgive other people. People. So in Proverbs 19, it says, A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offence. Or in Matthew 6, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us from the Lord's Prayer. Now you can imagine the disciples, as Jesus would keep on talking about forgiveness and grace and mercy, the discussions they would have had with each other, thinking, well, how forgiving should I be? Now, at the time when they were having these discussions, people would say, well, someone does a bad thing, maybe three times, maybe four times, but, you know, do something wrong four times, that's it. You've had it. So Peter goes to Jesus, and he's been very, very gracious. When you read what he says, you're thinking, gee, he's a good guy. He says, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Seven times? So he doesn't say three or four. He says, I'm going to give double the forgiveness of other people. Look how forgiving I am. And Peter at this time is probably feeling pretty godly, pretty gracious and pretty good about himself. Right up to the moment Jesus says, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Imagine some parent saying to some child, that's it, I've forgiven you 66 times, another 11 times and that's it, you're dead meat. Of course, it's not about 77 times, it's like a thousand or a million times. Peter picks that, uh, Jesus picks that number because... He's saying that our essence as believers is forgiveness. Then in Mark 12, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Don't hold grudges. You're hurting yourself. And that is so hard for people to learn this. So we've got to remember that Paul is writing this from prison. He's writing uh, from Philemon at the same time as Colossians and Ephesians. Uh, there are times that his food would have been horrible. He's shackled there. There are times that it would be cold. He's not really in a pleasant place. But what does he write from prison to encourage them? In Colossians chapter 3, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And of all these virtues, put on love which binds them together in perfect unity. So there's this real sense that Paul in prison could forgive other people. I'm horrified at times when I'll uh, read stories of uh, lovely Christian people who've been put into the uh, prison of war camps and the concentration camps of Nazi Germany. And you hear stories where they'll see a Nazi soldier who had beaten them and brutalise them. And one of the, uh, the prisoners after World War II could walk up to that man, not spit in his face, but say, I forgive you. How powerful is that to do? Then in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give thanks to our God and Father through him. Let God's forgiveness on you be poured out in forgiveness and grace and mercy to other people. So the final thing we need to look at today is, then what was Paul's attitude to being in prison? 
Now, if I'd been chucked into prison for being a Christian, I think I'd be yelling and screaming and, 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 and wanting justice and, you know, how dare you do this to me and stuff like that. But how did Paul respond to what was happening? Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what you have happened to me has happened really to serve the gospel. So as I said to him, say, yeah, I'm in prison, but God's using this. Yes, things aren't good, but God is using this moment. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. Because my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. What's Paul saying? He says, yeah, I'm in prison and I'm sharing the faith with all these people, but praise God, I'm encouraging other Christians to share their faith too. He doesn't say this is a bad thing. He can see that God is using this very moment for him. So is Paul feeling pretty good about being in prison? No, because he knows that beside being in prison, the next day could be death. He has no idea what the future holds. So in Philippians chapter 2, it says this, But even I, being, that even I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from my faith. I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. He's saying, look, my blood will be out on the sacrificial altar. This could be tomorrow. I could die, but I am faithful in this moment. I want you to be faithful too in these moments. He then goes on in Philippians 1.20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body whether by my life or by my death. He's very aware what it means for him to be in prison. And he says, I will act as a Christ-like person in this moment. In Ephesians 5, it says this, Be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what do we have here? God by his nature is forgiving. The gospel is forgiving. We are told as Christians that we have been fully forgiven by God. And therefore the fourth thing is that we should be forgiving towards others. Paul gives us a practical example of his time in prison and says, This is what it means for me. Now, with the letter to Philemon that we'll look at fully next week, came the letter of Ephesians and Colossians. And it's interesting, Ephesians and Colossians both have a section about what it means to be a Christian and a slave, and a section, what does it mean to be a Christian and a master? So let's have a quick squeeze at that. So in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, the first thing he looks at the slaves. says, slaves, obey your earthly masters, with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. And these are the words that Paul would have actually said to Onesimus, the slave who'd run away. He would have said, Onesimus, you need to obey your earthly master. You need to obey Philemon. And when you obey him, it's with respect and fear and sincerity of heart. Obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, do the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know the Lord will reward everyone who, with whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. Paul radically turns slavery around. He doesn't say, You're a slave, you're a good. You know, dogs, cats, chooks, cows, slaves. He doesn't put them in the same boat. He says, You are a human, you are special. Whether you're a slave or free, you are perceived who you are because God gives you worth for who you are. You are a human being. So there's a radical transformation of how Paul views the slave. And a slave doesn't say, I'm just doing this because my boss owns me. He says, you're doing it not for your boss. You're doing it for Jesus and the glory of God. And then the second part, he looks at masters. And very few people would have ever talked about what masters should do. But Paul does. He says, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, 
since you know that you have both their master and yours in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. And there's nearly a sense of two men say, this is not just a piece of goods. This is a person who has value, and you should treat him with the same Christ likeness you should treat anybody. Whether a slave or whether a king, each person deserves your respect. So let's just go to the next part of uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 4. Because Paul has uh, introduced himself. We know there's Onesimus. We know there's Philemon. But what does he say? He says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. Because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Paul knows that Onesimus is a godly person. A faithful person. One that is worth giving thanks for. He goes in verse 6 to say, Pray that you may be active in sharing your faith, so you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, my brother, have refreshed the hearts of saints. So how does Paul view this man? He views him with thanksgiving. He sees him as being faithful. A man who shares his faith, a man who is loving, who seeks good, a man who is joyous, a man who is encouraging, but most of all refreshing the hearts of the saints. And next week we're going to find that he's going to say to him, Onesimus, who once was lost, is found. Who once was blind, can see. Who once was a thief and a runaway, is now a child of God and your brother in Christ. And next week you'll be fascinated to see what response Paul wants from Philemon. Because here's Philemon who could easily kill the man and no one care less. He could beat him and no one would worry. But next week we're going to find out that uh, Paul has a totally transformed view of how they should treat each other. So what do we have in this story? We have a person who's powerless <coughs> being forgiven. We have in the story you and I being sinners but are forgiven. And there is nothing we could ever do to earn the forgiveness that comes from God. <coughs> I must admit, I uh, enjoyed running Bible study groups at Long Bay Jail. It was a long time since I did it. But I was quite fascinated by um, meeting murderers because they knew there's nothing they could do in the way of good works that could ever pay for the life they took. This passage reminds us that our forgiveness is in Christ and Christ alone. <coughs> Let's just bow heads in prayer.